using this idea of conservation of energy, there are ways to deal with fairly geometrically complex situation fairly easily. And this is especially when we cast certain what we call conservative forces, such as gravity, as a form of potential energy. So our overall energy balance equation can be written as such. The kinetic energy plus the potential energy in the beginning, all the work you added into it, so between time one and time two, of all the non-conservative forces, because all the conservative forces is tracked by these potential energies, would give you the final total energy of your kinetic and potential as well. So in that sense, it's useful to keep track of some stuff between time one and time two. And so in this case, time one is down on the bottom, just before you hit the ramp, and time two is on top, just when you get to the top of the ramp. Some of these things are useful to track. Whenever you have kinetic energy, it's good to track the speed. So here we have speed at time one, that's 12 meters per second. Speed at time two, we don't know, we'll keep as V2 or Vf. Then, because we're dealing with gravitational potential energy, it's also good to track the height. The height, we can set at zero anywhere we want for most common problems like these. So, we can set the height at the bottom of the ramp, then we know at the beginning, height is zero, at the end is 2.5 meters. So with all that, we can put the velocity here and then we can put the height here, velocity and height, we have almost everything. Except this time we do have a non-conservative force, which is friction. As this person is part way up the slope, the bottom of her ski is going to feel a little bit of friction going the other way. We can find out the work done by looking at the change in distance here, as well as the amount of force that friction is providing. So we have to do some force calculation to find out how big the friction is first. Note that the displacement and the friction in this case are going along the same line. It's, they go in the opposite direction though. So again, that's going to result in a negative work taking energy out of our system. Let's work out the actual magnitude of the friction force. Draw a proper free body diagram, keeping track of only the forces. We have mg, let's move that up, which will break up into x and y components as drawn. So there's that, very standard things, we've done this many a times. We've got theta given to us. And then of course we have the normal force from the slope, which will also give rise to some kind of friction because we're going up the hill, friction is going to come down the hill, kinetic friction. As typical, we'll do some of the forces in the Y, which is Fn minus mg cosine theta. And in this case, May, Ay is equal to zero. So Fn is equal to mg cosine theta, theta being my 35 that was given to us. And now knowing my Fn, I can work out that my friction force is equal to, or the size of it, is mu k times mg cosine theta. Now that's actually all I need in terms of forces. I mean, I can keep going and solve for the acceleration in the x direction by knowing mg sine theta and so on and so forth. But we're using energy to deal with all that for us. So we don't have to work out the acceleration and all that. We do, however, still need my displacement. So my displacement is this. What we know is it's 35 degrees, but we also are given that the height is 2.5 meters. This is all assuming that the, sl the slope is perfectly straight the whole way through, which from the diagram, it looks pretty close. So you can work out that sine theta or sine 35 
is equal to ops over adjacent. So the actual distance itself is 2.5 meters divided by sine 35 degrees. Which brings us to work. The only non-conserved work we have is the friction multiplied by my delta d. Of course, we have a negative sign here because the friction always takes energy away from us in the sense that it's always opposite to our whatever our velocity happens to be, in which case it's also the direction of the displacement. So we have negative mu k mg cosine 35 multiplied by 2.5 meter sine 35 degrees. And so we finally have this term in the middle as well. Putting everything together then, we have kinetic energy, which is 1 half mv1 square plus gravitational potential energy, which is mgh1 plus this work. So let's write that r out. And again, it's adding a negative. It's equal to my final 1 half mv2 square plus mgh2. We want to solve for v2 out of all this mass. This is 0. We can swing that over. So we have 1 half mv1 square minus mgh2 minus. And we take that all over my 1 half m. And good news, all the m cancels out. And so v2 is, since we're just caring about the magnitude, we're not going to put the plus or minus there. And this little bit of mass, so we have the 12 meters per second, all square, minus 9.8, so on and so forth. H2 is 2.5 meters. All over one half, which equals the square root of 89.402 meters square second square per second square. Therefore, it's equal to 9.455 meters per second or more conservatively, 9.46 meters per second. Clearly you slow down because you are going up the hill, so there's also a little bit of friction that slows down a little bit more, but mainly it's the fact that you're going up the hill that you are storing up more potential energy to give you less kinetic energy. Biggest takeaway lesson here, moving back to the top, is to write out your energy balance equation, your initial energy plus whatever change you do to it via work is equal to your final total energy. And most of these energy terms you can relate from two different times and it's good to make this lovely little chart to keep track of what you have to keep track of.